Often in economics and econometrics, we'll have series of numbers we want to add up. Summation notation comes in very useful in these cases. First, let's look at a series of numbers. We might have some value, say AI. That's an arbitrary element in the series. I goes, well, in this case, from 1 up to n, where n is a, an arbitrary large number. There might be particular values. Or we might have A representing some formula. Here we've got a simple one where the element is 2 times I minus 1. And we're going from 1 to 3. The first element of the series will be A1 equal to 1. 2 times 1 minus 1. And so on. A2 will equal 3. A3 will equal 5. That's our series. We can add them up. Well, we can add up this series quite easily. But if it was a larger series, it might be more difficult. We can represent the sum of that series as follows with summation notation. So we have our series we're adding up. We use the Greek letter, a capital sigma, there, and the typical element in our series that we're summing, AI, or, as we had before, with the formula. Here we're going from 1 to 3, but we could have longer series that we're adding up. So in this case, we're going from A0 up to AN, where again, N is some arbitrary large number. Let's look at the summation notation in a little bit more detail. We have sigma, capital of sigma there. The I that we've used there is our index of summation. Now, I is pretty typical, but other letters are also used, J, K, for example. The term to the right of the sigma, AI, or our little formula there is the, the sum and. And we have our index of summation, indicating the numbers we're summing over. The number below the sigma sign is the lower limit of summation. The number above the sigma sign is the upper limit of summation. So we're summing AI from 0 up to N. Both the upper and lower limits can vary. They can be particular numbers, or they could be represented by letters. Let's look at a couple of simple examples to start with. We want to evaluate the sum from i equals 1 to 5 of i squared. Well, it's quite simple. First, we write down our index numbers. So we go from 1 down to 5. Then we look at our sum and in this case i squared, and look at the values for in each case. So 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, and so on. And then we sum those up. So we have a total there is equal to 55. Writing out our answer, the sum from i equals 1 to 5 of i squared is equal to 55. Our next example is a little bit more complicated, but we follow the same process. Here we have the sum from m equals 2 to 5 of 5m plus 1. Once again, we write down our index numbers. We have m, 2, 3, 4, 5. Our sum and 5m plus 1. Well, when m equals 2, that will equal 11. When m equals 3, that will be 15 plus 1, that will be 16. When m equals 4, it will be 21. When m equals 5, it will be 26. If we add those up, we get 74. Once again, writing out our answer. So the sum from m equals 2 to 5 of 5, m plus 1 is equal to 74. Not all of our summations are as simple as those two examples. We can use rules of summation to modify the summation to make it simpler or to find solutions, as we'll see in a moment. The first rule is if we have two series uh, in the sum and, for example, AI plus BI, uh, we can separate those into two separate uh, summations, the sum of AI plus the sum of BI. or we could go back the other way. That's the additivity property. 
homogeneity property is the case where if we're multiplying each element in our series in the sum ant by some constant, so here we have C there representing a constant, we can take the, the constant outside the summation. So here we have the C outside the summation. The third property that's useful is if we have a constant term in our sum and, separate that out, and then we'd have the sum of a constant, so there's no little index number there. Well, if we're summing from 1 to n, it'll be n times c. We have a couple of examples here to illustrate how we can use those summation rules. These are a bit like proofs. In this course, we don't focus on proofs. And these examples are just to illustrate how we can use the rules and also to illustrate how we can use a bit of algebra to simplify summations. Have a look at the videos for these two examples after we've finished this module. We've dealt with the summation of a simple series. Sometimes we'll come across double summations. We have here two summation signs, and also we have two indexes of summation. Here it can be useful to think of our summation not in terms of a series, but in terms of an array. If we're thinking about an array and our index numbers, well, the first index number is usually thought of as being a row. The second one, j, of the column. We'll come back to this when we do a little bit of matrix algebra towards the end of the semester. So if we have i, j is equal to 2, 1, for example, that would be row 2, column 1, a, 2, 1. Do we have an array there? What we want to do then is to sum up the elements in the array. One way of doing that is to think about summing along each row, so taking, for example, the first row and summing up the elements in each column. So row 1, column 1, plus row 1, column 2, and so on, up to row 1, column n. So in the case of the first row, we'll be summing from column j equals 1 to n. We'll have our element a from row 1, and then j equals 1 to n. Similarly, for row 2, we'll have a2, so it's row 2, summing from j equals 1 to n, and so on, down the m rows. Thinking about that way, we'll have our m row totals, and the second step then is to sum those row totals. So we go from row 1 to row m. So that's row 1 there to row m, summing up those row totals. Let's see how we put that into practice with this example. 